Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we are delighted to welcome Neil deGrasse Tyson to the show. We'll discuss his latest book, Cosmic Queries, as well as the nature of intelligence, Carl Sagan, and a whole lot more. But first, we learn about one of the biggest problems in astrophysics as a new study lends further evidence to questions about the expansion rate of the universe. We also examine the oldest quasar jet ever seen radiating in x-rays. Then we look at a nearby exoplanet that lost one inhospitable atmosphere just to grow another one even more noxious. Since the Big Bang, galaxies have raced apart from each other as the universe expands. The rate of this expansion, called the Hubble Constant, is still in question as two significantly different values are found depending on where in the universe the observation is made. Measurements made from nearby objects are nearly 10% higher than values obtained when looking at the early universe. A new study of elliptical galaxies near the Milky Way confirmed the higher value found by other independent studies of nearby bodies. The reason for this discrepancy remains unexplained. An ancient supermassive black hole and accompanying quasar jet recently discovered using the Chandra X-ray telescope is the oldest such body yet found. This supermassive body 12.7 billion light years from Earth emanates a powerful jet of energy. Seen in X-ray light this jet extends 160,000 light years in length, about 60% longer than the width of the Milky Way galaxy. Examination of the exoplanet GJ1132b reveals this world may have once completely lost its atmosphere before forming a second. Astronomers using the Hubble Space Telescope have found this planet, slightly larger than Earth, may have once possessed an atmosphere of hydrogen and helium, which was pushed off to space by pressure from its parent star. Today, GJ1132b is covered with an atmosphere rich in toxic gases likely exuded from volcanic cracks within the thin crust of this alien world. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we talk with Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we are happy to be joined by arguably the world's best known astrophysicist, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. He is director of the Hayden Planetarium and the author of more than 12 science books, including his latest with James Treffel, Cosmic Queries, available now from National Geographic. So, 
Welcome to the show, Neil. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And I love what you've done with your backdrop. Very, very cosmic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so this book, you know, is just so full of interesting facts. I mean, the FPP ratio, you know, facts per page. <laughs> <laughs> That's a it's, thing. Okay, I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just, a, it's just off the scale. But you know, if you could have readers take just one thing away from reading this book, what would you want it to be? I want people to know that if you are curious, filled with wonder, you're not alone. And that the entire enterprise of science, especially in our field, astronomy, astrophysics, is um, we get to ask questions that uh, reach for the outer limits of space and time. And what a privilege that is. And so in this book, yeah, there's some questions that we have the answer to, and we're, and we're very, and they're very deep questions. They're not how hot is the sun or how far away is it? It's how did we come to know what we know about the universe? How did it all begin? How did the universe come to look the way it does? How will it all end? Um, and about the multiverse and the search for life. These are some of the deepest questions we've ever confronted in the history of civilization. And so, and so that, for that reason, because of how deep they are, it doesn't lend itself to a wiki page just to look up the answer. There's much more philosophical groundwork there to explore. And in some cases, even spiritual groundwork. So that's why I think, even though there's a high F, PP with fact per page, yeah, <laughs> high FPP. That you, it's it's a, it's not a chore to expose yourself to it because it's all the the, the fruits of the curiosity tree, and there you are with it in your hands, and you get to, and and you learn that some questions we have answers for, other questions the answers are kind of we're still working on it, and some other questions we don't even know if it's the right question yet. And it's the entire spectrum of how curiosity manifests in modern science. Yeah, and that, that brings us to the question of, you know, I mean, I have a, I live with an incredibly intelligent cat, Max, all right? But as the, smart the as Max... cat think the same thing of you. That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> now, as smart as Max is, and as, you know, or other animals like dolphins, you know, they they are not, as far as we know, you know, building radio telescopes. They're not measuring baryonic acoustic oscillations in the early universe. What is it that drives human beings to, towards science that... Well, it helps that we live on land, unlike dolphins, and that we have opposable thumbs to build stuff. Okay, even a dolphin, even if a dolphin says, I want to measure baryonic acoustic oscillations in the early universe, except all I have are flippers. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, so that's a short <laughs> afternoon at the bar, you know, at the dolphin bar. All right, just send me my next drink. We'll, we'll let that one go. <laughs> uh, so, um, but here, let me, let me, let me put you in a different place. Yeah. You, you have implied that we are some measure of intelligence coupled with our capacity to build. But suppose there's an alien species vastly more intelligent than we are. They would laugh at our pretensions right. that we are somehow achieved some level of knowledge and inquiry about the universe. When it's just, we're, when maybe we're just sort of, you know, touching the elephant in a different part, having no idea that there's an elephant standing in the middle and it's completely obvious to this other species that's vastly more intelligent than we are. So I don't want to, if we're the only intelligent species Earth ever had, what kind of a, comp in, by, by our measures, you know, philosophy, art, you know, music, all right, then what measure is that? It's, it's, it's a data point of one. So I'd rather stay open to the possibility that we're blithering, drooling idiots in the presence of some other intelligence out there, and that we think we're on top of things, and in fact, we're not. Right. And in that way, you don't take yourself too seriously. You're a little more honest about, I'm just curious, and I do all the best I can with my senses and with my intellect to try to figure it out. And we figured out 4% of the universe. That's good. I'm good with that. <laughs> but the dark matter and dark energy, the other 96%, we don't know what that is. And I lose sleep at night wondering, 
However smart we are, are we smart enough to answer the questions that we have posed about this universe? Or worse, worse than that, are we smart enough to have even posed the right questions in the first place? And Cosmic Queries is an exploration of that entire landscape. Yeah, it's amazing. So to you, what, what is the greatest mystery in the universe? <laughs> uh, I don't, I, I, that's too limiting. I can say, oh, just, I, I want to know how old you, I, you know, I could pose a question and then one day we'll answer it. Then I'm just ready for the next question. So for me, the, the greatest mystery is, is the universe entirely knowable? So in other words, might there come a day where there's no new science to learn? And we've not. already kind of hit that. For example, there's no new science in the periodic table of elements up to the biggest element that we've discovered, all right? We're not going to learn something new about hydrogen that we're going to say, oh, this belongs someplace else on this periodic table, right? right? Yeah. No, no, that's in the can right now. And so, and a triumph to many decades of hard work making that happen, going all the way back to, to Mendeleev. Um, in the, uh, when was it, middle 19th century? About that, and yeah. So, so, yeah, we, there are things we do understand, but it's not all things. And therein is the source of curiosity and wonder on the frontier of the unknown. All right. And one of the great questions about the unknown is, do we live in a multiverse? You know, <laughs> do, you know, you know, we think of, you know, left, right, up, down, backward, forward, and time as dimensions. But is there more to it than that? There's no reason to think there wouldn't be. Um, and if there's a multiverse, uh, there, there are different levels of multiverses, which we get into in the book. Uh, the simplest one, which shows up in movies, is there's a whole other universe out there, and it has all the same laws of physics as we do. And it's just another version of this universe um, and there's an infinite number of them. So in what, you can find a universe where you and I are having this very same conversation just because all combinations of atomic phenomenon are manifest if you have an infinite number of universes. So that's, so that's the traditional multiverse. But, um, and they would be part of the larger universe that we're in beyond our horizon, all right? That'd be like ships at sea where none of them are close enough to each other for their horizons to overlap. So they each think they've got their own universe, all right? But, but if you step back, wait a minute, you all are in the same ocean, okay? <laughs> you all have sails and you all have ships and, 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 and hulls and all the rest of this. So, but there are other universes in the multiverse scenario. Imagine one where it has different initial conditions. And you make a universe where there's no, no planets or, 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 two, or many more planets. All right, that's possible. And then there's another level multiverse, all this is in the book, by the way, where the laws of physics themselves turned out differently. Right. Well, that would be kind of dangerous to visit. You don't want to, you know, if the charge on the electron is slightly different and you step across that threshold you, and you collapse into a pile of goo because your atoms don't hold each other together in molecules anymore, that's something to consider in advance <laughs> of any steps you might take into that universe. Um, but um, otherwise, yeah, the, and also, are we in a simulation? That's a little scarier. Right. Are we just uh, the efforts of some snot-nosed kid living in his parents' basement, <laughs> programming us for their own amusement? And every time something weird happens in the world, like, oh, there's an assault on the U.S. Capitol. That, that must have been the programmer who was really bored, okay? <laughs> Things are getting too normal. Let's throw I, in something just for their own entertainment. I, so, I actually had that exact same thought when I heard of the uh, Keller, Keller Hornets, was it? Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't the year have enough in it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Murder Hornets, that was it. Yeah. Murder Hornets, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, yes, yeah, yeah, somebody's getting bored. We're in a hologram. Right, right, um, right. And actually, I have a listener question. Uh, Jason Love in it. Ipswich, Queensland, Australia, uh, would like to know, you know, given everything we're seeing with Perseverance and especially the Rosalind Franklin rover coming up, if we find life on Mars or another world like Europa, should we bring it back to Earth or should we leave it there? 
Well, NASA has protocols on this. It's called planetary protection. Mm -hmm. The planetary right. protection protocols specify in great detail the, how to prevent us from contaminating a planet we visit right. and how to protect... So in other words, how to protect the planet from being contaminated by us and how to protect Earth from being contaminated by the planet. An early version of that was in place during the Apollo era. You know, uh, the astronauts went straight into one of these um, canisters, uh, you know, one of these like um, Winnebago type places, and they conduct, we conducted experiments on them. Uh, the first conversation with them was through a telephone through, through the glass yeah, yeah. Um, uh, window. So we have protocols in place. So we shouldn't necessarily fear that. Um, although it'd be great stuff for science fiction storytelling. Mm. And finally, one final question. Um, one of the things you and I have in common is we had the same childhood hero, Carl Sagan. Excellent. And I just recently reread The Demon Haunted World. I think it's his best work. I think yeah. so too. And um, my, of course, that brought to mind you know, of course, the book is about the need for scientific thinking in the world and re scientific reasoning. And my question is, you know, given the challenges we're facing now with the worldwide pandemic and global climate change, how do, how do we keep the, lights of, this, the light of science alight? Yeah, that's a really important question. And I, I, have, a, I have a blunt, crass answer to that. Go for it. It's... Uh, scientists need advertising agencies <laughs> to for, to alert the public of how their lives are completely transformed uh, for the better because of science. And if you don't carry that knowledge with you actively every day, you'll start taking science for granted. You'll start saying, "What do the scientists know? I'll right. get what I need from the from chat rooms on the internet." But my friend told me, "How could you even? How is that even possible?" So somewhere in there, people need to be reminded of this. I think. Yeah. So also the educational system, I think it needs to be a little different. We shouldn't learn about science as a satchel of facts. Science as a means of querying nature, as a means of finding out what is objectively true in the world. Once that becomes how we think about the world, then you will never find yourself in a position of saying, I choose not to believe what the scientists say because it makes me uncomfortable, or right. I'd rather believe any from what my culture says or my religion or my politics right so that is an unstable world that you are creating if the objective truths of science are left to the whims and the whims of politicians and people who vote for them so yeah it's a challenge and i think it's uh, one can never let their guard down to make this happen Mm. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. It was great. Excellent. Well, thanks you. for your, and I got to run to the next one. But uh, yeah. good to see you at it. And, and spread. nobody doesn't love astronomy out there. And you're in the middle of that. So keep that going. Thanks so much. Take right. care. And that was Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Join us next week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion when we'll talk with physicist Dr. Lawrence Krauss, author of The Physics of Star Trek. We'll discuss his new book, The Physics of Climate Change, as well as Star Trek Tech. Subscribe or follow today and never miss an episode. Join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. Subscribers to our VIP newsletter see every episode of this show a day before the general public. And we depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, 
Please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or on any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net.